This section is about commas, and commas should be used to do the following. Set off introductory phrases. Separate items in a series. Set off transitional words or phrases. Set off a positives, or what we're going to put into a big group called interrupters. Set off non-restrictive clauses. Again, that's going to fall into a large category called interrupters. Set off parts of dates and addresses. Set off parts of compound and complex sentences. These are comma rules that you already know. So let's briefly look at some examples of each of these. Anytime you have an introductory phrase or an introductory clause, a group of words that opens a sentence, a group of words that comes before your subject, you need to set that introductory word group off with the comma. You also use commas to set off transitional words. And in our work with compound sentences and semicolons using transitional words, we learned that this is one sentence, this is another sentence, so my semicolon goes here to separate those two sentences. But because I'm beginning this second independent clause with a transition word, I put a comma after it. Here's an example of a transitional phrase um, with commas around it too. See how it sort of interrupts this sentence. So all these transitional words and phrases will have commas around them. If the transitional word or phrase starts a new sentence in the middle of the current sentence, then you're going to have the semicolon. In other words, if you have a compound. But just because you have a transitional word or phrase doesn't mean there's a semicolon. You wouldn't put a semicolon here because she's not a complete sentence. Commas in a series. Any three or more word or word groups in a sentence you separate with commas. So we have words here, Tom, Dick, Harry. You see you have the commas here even before the and. Here we have some verb phrases, but the same rule still applies. I can't decide if I want to sleep in, go jogging, or get started on my next essay. Commas with the positives or interrupters. Basically, in a positive, just renames, defi describes, or identifies a noun or a pronoun right before it. A positive can go anywhere in the sentence, but they're always right next to the word they're describing. And you put commas on either side of the appositive. And we call appositives interrupters because they interrupt the main idea of the sentence just to give more information. Think about them as being parenthetical information. Information you can take out of the sentence, and the sentence will still make sense. So right here, our math professor is an appositive or an interrupter that is describing Dr. Shabazz. So notice that we have commas around that appositive or that interrupter. It interrupts the main idea of the sentence to give us more information. Um, and so you need to make sure that you have that there. Um, you could take these words out and the sentence would mean exactly the same thing um, without the words there. So they're just additional information. So they interrupt and you need to put commas around them. Non-restrictive clauses are another type of interrupter. Now a restrictive clause contains information necessary to a sentence's meaning. So you don't put commas there. But as an interrupter, a non-restrictive clause is just additional information. You could delete the information and the sentence would still make sense. So you put, just like with an appositive, you put commas on both sides of a non-restrictive clause. So you can see here, this is my information about Sandra. I don't really need to know this information for my sentence to make sense. It's just parenthetical. So it's non-restrictive. It's another kind of an inter interrupter. And so um, you need to make sure that you put commas around those non-restrictive clauses. Now, a little tip, if you've often wondered when to use which or that, which always introduces an interrupter additional information, and so it always has commas with it. That always introduces 
important or necessary information so it doesn't have commas with it. And who can introduce either interrupting information or necessary information. And so you have to make the call for your reader whether or not you think the information is essential or not. And of course you know about commas and compound and complex sentences. Here's my compound sentence. Two sentences joined by a comma and a fanboy. And my complex sentence, remember if my dependent clause is first, I put my comma before my independent clause. Commas and dates. Make sure you're separating the day of the week from the month and the day of the month from the year. When a date that includes commas falls in the middle of a sentence, put the comma after the date, as is done here after 2004. Commas and addresses. Make sure you use commas and addresses to separate the street address from the city and the city from the state or the country. And like dates, when an address that includes commas falls in the middle of a sentence, place a comma after the state or the country, as we did here with North Carolina. So, use commas to separate items in a series, set off introductory phrases and parenthetical phrases or interrupters, set off positives or interrupters, non-restrictive clauses or interrupters, parts of dates and addresses, and parts of compound and complex sentences. Don't use commas before the first element of a series or after the last. Don't use commas between a subject and a verb. Don't use commas before fanboys when the fanboys are not connecting to complete sentences. Workbook exercises isn't a complete sentence, so you don't need that comma. Driving to school is not a complete sentence, so you don't need that comma. Don't use commas before a group of words beginning with that. and don't go comma crazy. Resist the urge to use a comma every time you're insure, unsure. Don't give in to comma-itis. Make sure you understand why you're using a comma before you use it. 